For Creamer Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Madi. Joining me today is conflict scholar and former soldier Mike Martin, here to discuss his book, How to Fight a War. So despite the title of your book, which comes across as a sort of how-to in warfare, it also shows the human side of war. Can you briefly discuss the relevance of this book specifically during today's geopolitical tension? So uh, I wrote the book because it became increasingly obvious that nobody really understands war and not just journalists and sorry to all the journalists out there, but you know, if you look at the media and the way they describe war, but also politicians, partly because we've lived in an era of unprecedented peace, we see a number of national leaders who don't really know how to exercise the military lever to achieve the goals that they want. So I I did write a a how-to, and it's written in the second person. It's written to the commander-in-chief. And the idea is to educate people about what war is. And one of the most important lessons, I think the one you picked out, that war is this deeply human phenomenon. And if you want to understand it, you really need to delve into human psychology. Now, your book also points out that strategy, logistics, training and morale are fundamental for success, perhaps even more so than weaponry. Can you just unpack that for us? So I I think it's linked to this point about the humanity or the humanness of war. It's often these things that I call intangibles that are the most important thing. So the most important thing is strategy, which is this linkage between what your goal is, how you're going to achieve it and what resources you're going to bring. And this is the most important, this is where psychology plays its part, because leaders always get this wrong. They're always overconfident. They're always hubristic. And so actually, if you want to make good strategy, what you need to do is is form a team where people have different points of view and they're able to debate and challenge assumptions and go, hang on, that's rubbish. We can't do that. We do need those resources after all. And so on, you know, we spoke about training. Well, that's about the quality of your people or improving the quality of your people. We spoke about morale, which fundamentally actually is a question of leadership, how good your leadership is. Okay, you need to supply your troops with, you know, food and water and and keep them dry and all the rest of it. But actually, if they've got good leaders, they'll put up with discomfort. Uh, And then finally, logistics. So this is where the material comes into it, uh, because, you know, as we're seeing again, let's go to Ukraine, which is a current war. It's so important. You know, the Ukrainians are having to cede territory at the moment because they don't have enough artillery ammunition. And again, it's quite interesting when you look into logistics and the scale of logistics required to fight a modern war. I mean, it's vast, vast thousands of shipping containers per day just to keep a single division on the road. But again, organizing those logistics is all about human systems. How do we get it from the factory Do we have the economy set? Does it get forward? Does it get transported? How does it get distributed on the battlefield? You need a human network to get that stuff to where it's needed on the front line. You mentioned leadership as a critical factor in battle. What qualities make a good leader in battle? Uh, Moral courage. Moral courage and integrity are the two most important things that leaders must have. Leaders with moral courage will do the right thing, even when it's the most difficult thing and particularly when it's the most difficult thing for them personally and that's linked to having integrity and always acting with integrity and the reason those two things are so important is because humans like to follow leaders who have moral courage and who do the right thing there is a very strong moral component to leadership so i'll give you an example let's say you have a platoon and they're on exercise and they lose some equipment and the leader knows that uh, the equipment's been damaged it's millions of dollars, right? And they've got an opportunity. They're out on patrol on their own. They can, they can basically say to their superiors that uh, we don't know. It just, we, you know, it just got damaged. It wasn't our fault, you know. But the leader knows what happened. Actually, they weren't being careful enough with that. And so he has a choice. Does he uh, front up to his commander and say, I'm sorry, actually, but we damaged it. It was our fault. This was the problem with it. Or he can say and cover his men. He can say, well, do you know what? It don't know what happened. You know, these things happen. And the men will be watching and women. And if the leader goes up to his boss and says, I, I take responsibility for this. Um, we, our troop, we broke it. And the reason we did that was because we weren't being careful enough or we lost it or whatever the, you know, the bad scenario is. And then he then you know, accepts blame for that and says, I will do whatever's necessary to make that right. The men will look at that and they will see a person of integrity. 
And it means that coming down the line when that leader has to make difficult decisions like, I'm sorry, Trooper A and Trooper B, I need you to charge that machine gun post. It's absolutely the right thing to do so that the rest of the platoon can get around the, you know, the left flank and survive. They know that he's making decisions. He makes all of his decisions or her decisions with the utmost integrity. And secondary to that concept that I've just described of moral leadership and integrity, I think is physical courage, which of course you need. Um, combat is very dangerous. It's destructive to human life. And leaders who don't have physical courage um, will uh, n- you know, not be followed by people who are in very, very dangerous situations. Now, your book also mentions the term violence as communication. Can you unpack mm. that term for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is this is the idea that, you know, often, again, this is something that the media often gets wrong. They see war as the opposite of peace. So you can have peace and then you're doing diplomacy or you can have war and you're fighting. But it's not that simple. War, famously, uh, as described by a famous theorist of war, is a continuation of politics. So it's what happens when you're not able to solve problems by talking. And what you then decide to do is start fighting because you've been you've reached the point where you can no longer talk to resolve that problem. But actually, what you're doing when you're fighting is you're still sending messages. You're still saying, you know, to give you a very, very trite example, you know, if you start by talking, saying, I'm sorry, but that hill is ours and we want that hill. And they go, no, no, I'm sorry, but we're, you know, we're having it. And they go, no, 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 we really, really want that hill. We really mean it. And they go, no, no, I'm sorry, but we're keeping the hill. Well, the next message that you send them is going to be one using lethal violence. And you might demonstrate with that violence. Look at this awesome firepower we've got. We really want you to leave that hill. Or you might kill a couple of people on that hill and say, we really want to take that hill. Or you might bomb the hill to smithereens and kill all of them. But in each case, you're sending a slightly different message based on your understanding of their psychology, their intent, their desire to hold on to that hill. And that is what you're doing at all levels in war, is trying to send messages to your opponent to reinforce exactly what it is that you want to achieve out of this contest. And instead of being a contest of words, it's a contest of violence. Now, as the world grows and evolves with technology, how do you think artificial intelligence will eventually play into warfare, particularly in terms of replacing human psychology? Yeah, I think it's a a great question, right? Because um, if strategy is this contest between two brains, you know, I've spoken about the importance of psychology, what happens when we have artificial brains? And this is a question we don't really know the answer to, but we do know it will be different. So I'll give you an example. At the moment in warfare, we've got lots of automation. We have, uh, you know, missiles that you can fire and then they lock onto their target and they follow the the plane, the heat signature and they explode. We also have, uh, you know, helicopters that are able to pop up over hills and find lots of targets and then prioritize them and then wait for a human operator to push. Yes, destroy that one, destroy that one, destroy that one. So we've got levels of automation at a low level in warfare already. And of course, you know, we're talking about, are we going to have greater levels of automation with perhaps drones? Uh, You know, they're not automatic at the moment, but will they become automatic? Could you have drone swarms with thousands of drones that are linked together with an AI processor that causes them to swarm in particular ways? You know, so there are lots of things really that are in development now that are on the cusp of being developed that are are really pushing that, that level to which automation is used. But come back to strategy. So strategy is this contest between the two brains of the opposing commander. And that's why war has these dynamics of bluff, retreat, uh, you know, attack. It's had the same dynamics for thousands of years because we've had the same human brains involved in conflict. But if you replace one of those brains, so let's say on one side they have an AI making the decisions about which divisions to go where, what to do with supply lines, where to attack, where to retreat, then suddenly you've got a different quality of intelligence. And so we don't really know what that's going to look like. And it's a bit like what happened when AI beat the world grandmaster at Go. He beat the world grandmaster at Go and all the world's, the eminences in in the game of Go, which is this Eastern game of strategy with, with pebbles on a board, they all looked at this game and said, oh, wow, And when they unpicked it, they saw how the artificial intelligence had won, 
But they said we'd never have seen that move coming. It just wasn't in the thousands of years of human play that we've studied. So the artificial intelligence had come up with a new way of winning, with a new strategy, a new set of tactics, a new dynamic. And so the question is, as automation gets to higher levels in warfare, as artificial intelligence takes over some of that decision making in warfare, is warfare going to look different? Will it will the dynamics that have been familiar to us for thousands of years will they change and and that is a question that we don't know and it's a question that really is a bit scary and that's why people are looking at how they can or certainly people are discussing how they can limit the use of artificial intelligence in warfare now mike you advocate for successfully prosecuting a war um and you argue that this resolves conflicts faster so how do you respond to those who might say this is warmongering so i also make the point very clearly in the book that the best way to win a war is not to fight it, right? The important thing you must do is avoid war because it's horrendously destructive of people, most importantly, materiel, you know, cities. Look at what's happening in Ukraine and in Gaza. We're seeing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people killed, displaced. We're seeing cities destroyed. So I would never, ever advocate for war as a solution to problems. However, as we've seen throughout human history, there are geopolitical problems that are deemed to be intractable, right? And so clearly, President Putin felt that where the border of Eastern Europe was, was a a problem that he could not negotiate with European powers and America. Now, perhaps there could have been a negotiation there, but it wasn't. And he felt that he had to go to war. There will always be people who feel that they need to go to war in order to achieve their geopolitical goals. And then I argue, as you just said, if you are going to go to war, then you've got to win as quickly as possible, because the quicker you win, the less destruction there is and the more satisfying. And by satisfying, I mean the more complete the solution to the geopolitical problem is. And this goes back to where we started the interview, which was that leaders and the media don't understand how to prosecute wars mostly. They don't know the difference between a division and a brigade. And it sounds like a technical point, but if you don't understand these technical points about war, if you don't understand the most important thing is human psychology, if you don't understand that violence is actually a way of communicating and all of that, then you are going to end up in a war that stalemates. And At the moment, we're seeing a bit of an impasse again to come back to Ukraine. There's a bit of a geopolitical impasse. The United States is focusing on its presidential election. So supplies are drying up. There's domestic politics taking over in America. Europe is looking at American support drying up and thinking, hmm, okay, well, what are we going to do here? People are starting to hedge. Either way, the quicker the Ukraine war ends decisively, one way or the other. Obviously, I hope it ends in the Ukraine's favour. I'm in favour of international borders being respected, international law being respected. I'm in favour of countries not committing war crimes and all that sort of stuff. Um, But wars must be won, and they must be won decisively, and they must be won quickly, because that is the way you do it with the least destruction, and also the way that solves geopolitical questions. There's no point in fighting a war and finishing it quickly, but in a way that doesn't solve any geopolitical questions. So again, to use Ukraine as an example, if we were to freeze the borders in Ukraine where they are now and just say, okay, guys, you know, stalemate, so let's just draw the border where the troops are now, I have no doubt that in five years we will be fighting another war in Eastern Europe against Russia because deterrence is something that gets more expensive the longer you leave it. And Putin has not been deterred. And that's why we're fighting in Ukraine. And so to let him see the benefits of that aggression, I think, is inviting further aggression. Lastly, Mike, your book sets out some advice for lasting peace and avoiding revenge is one of the points you make. What are some of the other key considerations? Well, uh, this, you know, comes down to the quality of leadership. And um, it's also slightly linked to when I look around the world at the moment, I see very few leaders of the stature required to fight big wars and to settle big geopolitical questions. And I'm, I'm concerned that over the next few years, we might end up in one of those big wars. The point about revenge is is linked really to this idea of settling a conflict decisively. And if you settle a conflict decisively, that means you've won and you have all the power. And then the question is, how do you use that power? 
And we've seen examples throughout history where victors have decided to annex enemy territory, incorporate their populations into their own populations, uh, to strip their economies, and so on and so forth. And so this is either taking revenge or taking the spoils of victory. And we've also seen examples in history where victors have taken a step back and they've looked 50 or 100 years into the future and said, what do we want the world to look like then? And then they've gone and set about rehabilitating their enemies uh, in a way that restores their dignity and restores their pride. There is some process, of course, of justice for crimes that have been committed. And there is some sort of process of reconciliation and drawing a line under the conflict. But ultimately, it's done in a way that allows everyone to move on. You know, humans accept that we have wars. The question is, how do we move on from them? And there's lots of examples in history. I mean, the most obvious one is, of course, after the Second World War uh, and the rehabilitation of Germany uh, uh, and of, of Japan. Um, South Africa, of course, has an ex- not after a war, but had an extraordinary process um, post-1994 where there was a reconciliation, you know, led by Mandela and Tutu. And then we have examples where it hasn't worked. So, for instance, in Afghanistan in 2001, after the civil war, when the US and other coalition partners went in to kick out the Taliban, that was at the point where Afghanistan had been in a civil war for 20 years. And it was ripe for a process of sitting down and some kind of process of transitional justice where whatever form it took, crimes could be recognized and a line could be drawn and then parties could move on. But that process was never gone through. And so those grievances from the civil war from 1978 to 2001 fed into that conflict post 2001 and really supercharged the conflict that was still going on when America and Britain and France and all the other countries were kicked out of the country in August 2021. So it's really, really important once you've won your war to then think very hard about the politics and think about what you want the world or this region or these countries to look like in 50 years' time and to set about securing the peace. That was conflict scholar and former soldier Mike Martin discussing his book, How to Fight a War.